So folks, here I am, 297 pounds. You know, the funny thing about fat people is I won't claim 300 because fat people never get on the scale when they know they're enormous. We only get on the scale when we know we're a little bit down to make ourselves feel good so we don't have to change anything. I must, I'm sure I was over 300. And I've lost, as I'm sitting here, about 98 to 100 pounds, uh, depending on the day. But nevertheless, the third part of this big penny drop in the middle of the night, my lab data, I could never understand it. And even though we explained it away, and we rationalized it like so many scientists do. The back of my head, it still bothered me. It still bothered me, but I never understood why. And then I had this big kid with his gallbladder and watching what he was eating and realizing that his obesity didn't come from eating fat, it came from eating sugar. And then looking at myself and knowing what I love to eat, and I eat pretty darn well, but the overwhelming majority of the food that I was eating was sugar and starch. And the penny dropped and I realized, oh my God, we've got it completely upside down. We're blaming fat for what sugar does. We're blaming fat for what sugar does. And under the influence of insulin, look how damn well I was be able to shove that sugar into the, into the liver cells. And yet within three hours, those same liver cells were turning that sugar into fat. And we know that that fat gets shipped out and gets stored in the, in the body. And that's where this comes from. This comes not from the consumption of fat, but it comes from the conversion of sugar to fat by the liver and by the fat cells themselves. Because DNL, de novo lipo, uh, lipogenesis, occurs in the liver cells and the fat cells. So we realize that this is where it's coming from, folks. And then the part of the puzzle that I didn't understand that now I had so much clarity for is that those endothelial cells, they swell up. We showed that in the laboratory. They become uh, activated. They're like, and they become, instead of being resistant, like Teflon, to the cells in the blood system, the immune cells in the blood system that should just rush by. These cells are now activated because they're injured. And they're saying, hey, I'm inflamed. I need help. I need help. They're raising inflammation as a trigger to say, come and help me. I need to be healed up here. There's a breach in the wall. And how does the body fix that damage that was caused by sugar? It plugs it up with a little fibrin clot and then platelets stick to that and become activated. And the platelet activation attracts the white blood cells and the white blood cells then get activated in that. And experiments we've done later show that as that clot then dissolves, it heals up. But if it doesn't, then the macrophages and the Kupfer cells attract in lipid. So if the small little blood vessels get completely blocked up by this clot, they're dead. They're gone. They're gone. They're plugged up. They're gone. That's what happens in the peripheries. That's why diabetics' toes drop off. But in the larger blood vessels, that process is not only happening in the major blood vessels, the arteries and the wall, where it really doesn't matter that much. It probably doesn't matter that much. But every blood vessel is a living organ and every blood vessel has its own little capillaries. And that same injury is happening right there. And then what happens is it spreads to the surface and you're getting this knot, this blood clot, cellular blood clot knot. And what do the macrophages attract? They attract LDL, they attract fat-laden, lipid-laden, cholesterol-laden lipoprotein molecules, which are the transport molecules of fat. And they plug that, they connect and they, they uh, 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 attach to that clot and they're trying to smooth things over. They're trying to plug that hole, like spackle that you put on a broken hole in the wall. And the penny dropped for me. So. Around 1999-2000 is when I started to realize, wow, we have an issue here. And, and who was the predominant person at the time in the world that was looking at people like me, fat people? Dr. Adkins. But Dr. Adkins was being maligned because he was telling people not to eat sugar. Come on, it's so important for your brain. But I realized 
that Atkins was right. So you see how all of this comes together when you have an open mind, when you have a mind that is inquisitive, even though I made the mistake of not believing my own data at first. <coughs> Excuse me. And as we evolved the story, I looked more and more at my obese patients and I realized, wow, this is a problem. And at that time, we didn't have the capacity to help obese patients, especially kids, who had already developed the end-line diseases, gallstone disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, uh, pseudotumor cerebri, which is a kind of migraine that, that people get from sugar, a variety of sugar-related diseases. We could help the endpoint problems, but we couldn't help the obesity itself. So I developed a, an algorithm at Vanderbilt where we started to do bariatric surgery. And because there was so much scrutiny of us operating on obese children, I then went into private practice and moved. Uh, I was going to go to New York, but this was 9-11. This was 2001. So my wife wouldn't allow me to go to New York with two young kids after the terrorist attacks there. Um, so we moved to Florida. And um, eventually in Florida, within a couple of years, I established my own private practice where we were operating on and taking care of obese children but using a carbohydrate approach rather than a fat, calorie, eat less, do more exercise approach. And yes, we were operating on these kids to help them to lose the weight because we didn't fully understand at that time what was motivating them to eat. But as I bumped into these kids in the office, as I met and spoke to them and interviewed every child and every family, whether the family was obese or not, it became so obvious when you spend time in the trenches that these kids had all, not intentionally, but subtly migrated away from eating primarily for the nutritional value of feed, whatever the hell that was. And they created a whole opportunistic environment for themselves where they were managing emotional distress, anxiety, stress, depression, anger, fear, frustration, boredom, and pleasure. They were managing emotional tension by snacking and eating and drinking sugar and starch. And it became so obvious to me in my own life, looking at what I was doing and looking at what these kids were doing, not making time to invest and create time spaces in our lives where we could put effort into doing something that relaxed us, like going for a walk or doing something creative. That what we did is we filled our lives with opportunistic instant gratification. And that instant gratification came from sugar and starch, not from food. Nobody gets high on steak. But we specifically and exclusively related, uh, uh, created a relationship with sugar and starch and with carbohydrates as a way of life, as a way of emotional buoyancy. And it was so damn effective and so damn good that by the time we started to accumulate weight, we were so deep that we were able to ignore and rationalize and distort the reality of that harm to continue the relationship and that that relationship was and always will be broken. It's an addiction. That's the evolution of the carbohydrate addiction model, folks. It doesn't come from a textbook. It comes from, play, from spending time in the trenches like I do over here. In my own life, looking at myself in the mirror and being objective by myself as best I could and also understanding the lives of my patients. And once you understand that, that obesity and its friend diabetes, which is really the vascular injury we're seeing, the same thing, depending on whether insulin is able to shove the sugar into the cells or not. Because sugar in the blood vessels we call diabetes. Sugar in the cells we call obesity. And there's usually a mix of the two. One is always predominant. But it, the cause is sugar, chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. And that's where the carbohydrate addiction came from. That's where the carbohydrate addiction doc, the carb addiction doc, was born. In the trenches with patients. So folks... When you look at the gum flappers on the internet, be it me, be it anybody else, what is their backstory? What is their backstory? What is their experience? What is their knowledge? When they're telling you something, is it based on fact or belief? Is it based on association or cause? 
Oh, I feel fatigued. My magnesium level must be low. I love my magnesium pills. Or, oh, I can't, uh, 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 I fall asleep during the day, so I have to take my ashwagandha or my St. John's wort. Seriously? Because some guy on the internet, some person on the internet told you that was what you had to do? But we're victims of that belief system. So if you're going to base your life and your life path on advice from somebody, your doctor, somebody on the internet, figure out who the hell they are and what their credibility is. And do that research. Folks, there's mine. That's just a tiny fraction of mine. And I'm not saying I'm the best in the world, but I can stand up anywhere, anytime and point to my history that led me to where I am right now in the way I manage my patients. And if you're struggling with diabetes and you're struggling with obesity and you're struggling with metabolic health, let me at least help you to understand why. And this series, this series of carb addiction videos all come from that experience. I'm very happy to say, I don't know. I'm very happy to research a topic and apply my knowledge to it. And the videos that you're going to see on this channel are all based on that. That's who I am. That's who I am professionally. <laughs> on a personal level, it's a, it's a whole different screwed up story. Because obviously, it, it, it's not a healthy, normal life that made me fat in the first place. And I'm still wrestling with that. We're going to talk about fat head in another video, which is no matter what this looks like, this is always fat. But that's coming up. But folks, why did I make this video? It wasn't just about me. But I can sit down and tell you exactly what my credentials are and what my experience is. And those two, credentials plus experience, are what you want from someone you take advice from. And one final piece, autonomy, 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 autonomy from fiscal influence. I don't sell anything, I don't pitch anything, and believe me, I have had plenty of opportunities to enrich myself by being a spokesperson for products. If I am ever a spokesperson for a product, it is not because I'm getting paid for it. It's because I truly believe that the product has value to my patients. So there is no fiscal incentive for me to tell these stories. And I hope that resonates with you. I hope that that gives you the ability to trust what we say and to take on that as a life path. Because ultimately the objective of my own life is to improve myself and the objective of my practice is to help you to improve yours. Not to do it for you. Not to do it for you. Not to make you do anything. But to give you information that you can then decide for yourself based on the pieces of paper on this wall behind me and my life in the trenches. To help you to convince yourself that this is a path you choose to follow. It's not me telling you to follow it. You get to do this. You don't have to do it. And I hope that resonates. And if it does, give us a shout. We see patients in this office. We see patients virtually. The best way to get hold of us is to text or WhatsApp or call 561-517-0642. Leave a message. Someone in my office will get to you and set up that visit. But good luck out there and make sure you know where your information is coming from. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Thank you.